CEO initially. Um, we'll have some breakout rooms throughout this event. Um, hopefully you'll get a lot better understanding of, of the subject matter. Um, and what I'll do now is I'll pass you straight on to our initial intro video, uh, which is covering more about workers' rights and labour exploitation. Just going to share. The idea came through a desire, really, to introduce the subject of labour exploitation and modern slavery into the education curriculum. Working alongside Boston College, we worked with the University of Nottingham Rights Lab and the Skills Education Group to sit down and, and really design you know, what was important to students, what would be important to ourselves, to create that, that, that qualification that reflected the modern economy. My role at the Rights Lab at the University of Nottingham is to help to advance understanding about modern slavery, about the conditions that lead to exploitation, and the work that I do is particularly about how can we make our communities more resilient against exploitation. One really important way that we can do that is through education. We were fortunate to receive funding from the Home Office and that funding really allowed us to accelerate the work. We've piloted it across a whole range of different types of organisation, uh, from colleges to training providers, those people that are on apprenticeships and in young offenders settings too. The course itself has been fantastic. The young people have gained so much insight into their own rights within the workplace. Learners have given really good feedback they were loved that it was interactive, that it had quizzes, case studies, videos. There were a lot of really good tips uh, just for getting a job. The scams were also very good. Some of these scams are so realistic, you know, I could even fall for some of them and, you know, I shouldn't be in that position now. There was an excellent feature where you could select different languages and it could be interpreted into different languages and that was a real bonus for us because we work with really diverse communities who speak multiple languages. This course has opened my mind to things that happened to other people that I didn't understand and didn't know about. It made me become more aware of people's uh, body language and cues as such that I probably wanted to have picked up on prior to doing the course. It naked rear, so now you look, go around looking at your world in a different way. It's probably had more impact on a lot of things because it's practical, it's real, it's filling in information I didn't have before. There's real potential for this course to have a significant impact on the way that people understand and uphold labour rights within the workplace. Giving people that awareness gives them the, the, the confidence and understanding but collectively it makes the workplace safer for all. I think it's going to be a really important course for us, certainly in Greater Manchester. Um, we run a huge programme of ESOL um, and quite often at the end of their ESOL journey they are looking for work so we would certainly look to, to blend this into part of the ESOL course. This information will, will be integral to having that positive resettlement opportunity once they, they, they go back into their communities and, and try to re-engage in, in the world that, that you know, presents itself. The more people are out there equipped with the knowledge and understanding of what to look for, we can tackle this as a society uh, and I'm hoping in the long term that this will be something that helps uh, combat the scourge of modern slavery. Good afternoon everyone again. I hope you found that, that video very informative. Um, we're now going to go into a breakout room and pose a particular question. Um, to do so, I'm going to pass you to a, another member of the relationship team. Yep, great. Okay. So the question is, we'll put the slide up in a moment, but the question is, we want you to think about what is your current understanding of workers' rights and labour exploitation in the UK? We'll just pop the question on the screen. Thank you. Okay. Um, so there's a question. I'll, I'll, we'll have it in the group so we can read it out again. And I think Mel's going to pop this into our particular groups now. 
really, really good points raised there. Um, it might be an idea to just share quickly some of them from the from each room. Um, so, um, Kay, would you like to just feedback with the rest of the group some of the great points we raised in our particular room? Yeah, definitely. So, some of the thoughts people were having around what workers' rights and labour exploitation could involve was uh, topics around what kind of contracts do people have in the workplace? Um, do people know what the minimum wage is? Um, one of the members of our group raised the fact that they read an article around hand car washers um, and how some of the people are trapped in those um, types of jobs. Um, and then it definitely made her more aware going forward that um, she would choose more wisely about where she goes to wash her car because of the impact that um, kind of really we're contributing to. Also, um, June from our group said around um, it's that it's that second part of um, the title of the qualification is that people have got less awareness of, which is the labour exploitation side of things um, around um, that we need to we need to kind of know more about, to, especially when related to young people and county lines kind of um, work. And also Paul from Northern College talked about the work he's done with some survivors of modern slavery where they they come from coming from another country and they hadn't actually realised that they were being exploited because the laws are different in this country. And then finally, Neil, who had a bit of an advantage because he's ex gang matters labour abuse, but he was saying one example of something that um, he came across in his work was um, one employer, gang master, had withheld holiday pay from all of his staff, um, which resulted in half a million pounds worth of savings money that, that should have been kind of was entitled to be with those staff. Um, and that there's there was more and, there's more and more threats of violence from uh, the employers as well towards the employees. So that was our group. Thank you very much, Kay. Um, would anyone from any of the other rooms like to share their feedback, please? I'll share mine if you like, Paul. Yes, okay. please. Okay, okay so um, really reiterated a lot of what Kay has already said. We, we talked about um, the potential sectors that could be um, more exposed than others in the care sector um, came out in a couple of conversations. We talked about the diverse communities that we're living in today and how the it's you know a continually sort of evolving community that we live in, and also we we mentioned um, that it applies to everybody, including those returning to the workplace. So not just people new into work, people that have come back after after some time, really. Okay. Superb. And um, any other feedback from any other rooms? So there was just the two rooms. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for your input so far. And it's really good to get a good idea of what everyone's thoughts are really in regards to this. And we're lucky enough today to have some guest speakers. Um, so I'd like to kindly pass you over to, um, to Frank Hansen, um, who's the Head of Prevention and Partnerships, Gang Masters and Labour Abuse Authority. Frank. Thank you, Paul. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very quickly, and it will be a, a very whistle, whistle stop uh, presentation just a bit about the gang masters and labor abuse authority and, and really just to finish off as why we really think this this qualification is is you know is, is such a a big um, ambition of ours so the the gang masters and labor abuse authority it was formed in the aftermath of the Morecambe bay tragedy which some of you may be familiar with uh, when 23 chinese copper pickers uh, were left to drown, and that was by a ruthless gangmaster who basically recruited them to pick shellfish. And when the incoming tides came in, uh, they didn't know what to do, and, and they just left the the, the cockle pickers to their to their mercy. Uh, that was known then as the Gangmasters Licensing Authority, and that was formed in two thousand and six. Uh, we are now called the GLAA, and we are a, a non departmental public body. Is, is what we're known as. We're basically a quango, if, if you're familiar with those terms, uh, sponsored by the Home Office. Our aim is, is to work in partnership to protect vulnerable and exploited workers. So it's just as straightforward as that. So how do we do this? Well, there are three key parts to our organisation. Uh, the first one is regulation. We operate a licensing scheme to regulate businesses 
that uh, provide workers to the fresh produce sector and also the horticultural industry. And we do that to make sure that they meet the employment standards required by law. So any, any business that is supplying workers into that sector have to have a license and we're the organisation that issues that license. And we will do a range of, of, of checks and uh, to make sure that basically they are fit and proper to, to hold the license. And we will monitor that license and take appropriate action should we find that they're not complying with the, with the standards. And I'm pleased to have uh, Neil on, on the call, uh, who for many years worked for the, uh, the GLA and the GLAA and knows much more than, than I do about the, the organisation. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm on, uh, I feel I'm on uh, exam duty here. So the next uh, area is enforcement. Uh, we investigate reports of worker exploitation and illegal activity, and that could be around human trafficking, uh, forced labour and the legal labour provision. Uh, we do that again working with partner organisations such as the, uh, the police, the National Crime Agency and other government law enforcement agencies. Uh, I don't want to get into too complicated but our powers uh, around forced labour and uh, trafficking at the moment only relate to England and Wales. We don't have those powers in, in Scotland and Northern Ireland. But we will always assist investigations in those in those countries, should we be uh, asked to do so. And the final strand of our work is prevention. And our prevention work again is uh, made possible by working with such a, a diverse range of partners. Uh, we work very closely with industry. I know somebody on the call did talk about particular sectors, and we have what's called uh, strategic threat assessments where we gather intelligence uh, of where labour abuse, modern slavery is occurring around the UK. And from that, we build, if you like, a portfolio of sectors where the risk is, is highest. And you won't be surprised to know that that includes agriculture and, and food processing, but also sectors such as hand car washers, uh, nail bars, uh, the hospitality sector, uh, textiles, to name, to name but a few. So those, those, that, that intelligence helps determine where we put our resources and where we open up our investigations. Uh, and, and that prevention side in, in particular is, is where the qualification comes in. Uh, we want people to be aware of, of their basic employment rights that are provided by the UK law. Uh, we want them to recognise the signs of exploitation and, and where to get help and, and support. So when we were thinking of uh, how we did this, we'd ran a pilot with, with Boston College, uh, really looking at to be how we could develop it. And, and from then with conversations with the skills and education group, we decided that a qualification would help us really maximize that exposure uh, because colleges, and, and I used to work you know, in, in further education. So I'm, I'm really familiar and, and, and passionate about the work that, that colleges do. And for me, they're rooted in their communities. Uh, they know who their local partners are. They know their local employment. Uh, they work with, with local employers. Uh, their intake of, of students comes from that, 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 that same community. So for me, I saw it as a natural that they should be really at the vanguard of, of this qualification to extend it really right across the, the UK. So I'll leave it there because I know it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very... Uh, uh, brief presentation and I'll hand back to, to Paul, but quite happy to ask uh, answer any questions. Frank, thank you very much um, for that informative bit of information there. I really appreciate it. And I hope you all found it very, very useful. Uh, I'm actually going to pass you now to my colleague Pete, um, who's going to run through a little bit more um, about our level one award in workers' rights. Um, and labour ex labor exploitation qualification, and um, a bit more about sort of what it is and how to access it. Now we'll be able to see the uh, who we are slide, which I'm, I'm guessing that everybody does have an understanding of who Skills and Education Group are, as we already sat here today. But I just thought it was worth just clarifying for people. Obviously, there are a number of different arms to the organisation. 
in particular the Skills and Education Group Awards, which is where this level one qualification sits. But if anybody is on the presentation today who is a BIIAB member or a Skills and, Educa Skills and Education Group Access customer, and they and you are looking to access the award, we can do mutual recognition. So just because you're not currently a Skills and Education Group Awards customer won't prevent you in any way, shape or form from moving forward with this qualification in the really usual way. The Level one award in workers' rights and labour exploitation, as Frank has already discussed, is being put together alongside the Gangmaster and Labour Abuse Authority as a direct request for working with the Home Office because of the need in the marketplace. It's a really, really short and sharp 10 hour, one credit, small credit uh, score qualification. It's accredited by Ofqual and Qualification Wales. It's got funding from the ESFA. So if anybody does have a direct funding contract from the ESFA, then it is possible for you to claim funding to um, pay for this. And it's also, it's aimed at young people and adults that are entering or returning to the world of work. So we've worked in particular with groups of people on traineeships and apprenticeships as they move into their first jobs and people who are returning to the jobs market. And especially as has been highlighted in terms of some of the conversations around a lack of awareness for what is right and wrong within the UK setting, for people for whom English isn't their first language. Really, the whole idea behind this is that it makes sure that learners have got the knowledge to underpin their job application and then underpin them in the working world. It's about getting it right from day one, from the very point that people are identifying a potential job to apply for, spotting all of those warning signs and making sure that you minimise the risk to open yourself up to being exploited. It can be delivered in a range of different languages and, and the online platforms have been developed for that. However, I do just want to stress that the, the assessment at the end has to be undertaken in English. There's four different ways that the qualification can be delivered. Our online learning platform, and as somebody mentioned within our breakout room earlier, once you get the online platform up and running, it works really, really well. It flows through really, really nicely. Equally, if organisations have got, have already set up the skills network, it's available as one of the online options for the skills network platform that works in a very, very similar way. It does physically come in a traditional handbook, and um, we, we do have a boxes of those in the office. If, if somebody does want to deliver it via a, a distance learning method that isn't online, that's an option. And there is that classroom devised assessment. So that can be using the handbook. It can be using the online platform physically in the classroom. And we, we found that organisations that are accessing things like study programme have been using this as part of their programme, including it within it in a really, really successful way. There are a number of, well, there are five learning outcomes and assessment criteria that actually form the basis of this 10 hour qualification. You are getting all these slides afterwards. So I'm not gonna go through these in an awful lot of detail with you now, because ultimately, you'll soon get bored of the sound of my voice. All of that information there is there for you, but it just goes through everything that somebody needs to know so they're not at risk. Searching for a job in the first place, the different types of job that are available, the rights that an individual has as they apply for a job and they are in work, how to recognise signs of exploitation. And I think the really important point there is, and it's not just recognising signs of exploitation for you, the individual, but actually recognising signs of exploitation and labour exploitation in the wider world, in the wider workplace, potentially with colleagues, and also making sure, most importantly, how to prevent it from happening in the first place, so that hopefully over a period of time, this qualification becomes less and less important as everybody is fully aware of their rights and responsibilities. You've seen the introduction video that we showed you at the very beginning. That forms one of six that we've produced alongside all of our partners that have put this together. They are all available on our YouTube channel. If anybody wants any more information about any of them, then we can send you that information equally. All of these are hyperlinks that go directly to the videos within the presentation. So when you do receive the presentation after the event, you'll be able to get, look, look at all of those videos. So if you do have colleagues that actually, you're sat in now thinking, oh, it would just have been good if one of my colleagues was here, because it would be really relevant for their um, learner base. You can share these videos with them. You can really make sure that it's explained in the greatest possible detail. I think the, 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 the My Experience video and the Impact videos are really, really 
insightful in terms of the the way that this qualification makes a real difference both to the individual and then the wider individuals group as well there's a number of different people that ultimately this qualification would really benefit from one of the key areas is actually staff knowledge and actually if you have colleagues within an fe setting if you're within a um, employment base making sure that every employee is fully versed with everything they need to know about the science of labour exploitation. Clearly, it's really, really important about educating learners, particularly those that are either entering the workplace for the first time or returning to the workplace after a prolonged period to make sure that they don't put themselves in any risk. An awful lot of work around vulnerable groups and we're working with National Vulnerable Action Plans, work with particular sectors, you know, hospitality, fashion, textiles, health and social care, the areas where individuals are entering the workplace for the first time. Making sure that anybody that's in a vulnerable group who is especially at risk in this area, be it an ESOL need, be it a learning need, they get all the help and support that they need, both to make sure it doesn't happen to them and be able to spot the signs of it in um, their friends and wider group. In terms of what you physically need to do to add this qualification to your existing portfolio, we have an internal form called a CR2, which actually is, is the intention to deliver form. It's a really, really straightforward form. If you're already set up as one of our centres, that's again the hyperlink that'll take you straight to the form. You will then complete that form, send it into us. Our customer support team will be in touch with you to take you through the process to make sure that we've got everything that we need and your individual relationship manager will be on hand as well. So if you do have any individual, if you have any questions, you can ask those of your individual relationship manager. All of the relationship management team are on the call now. Hopefully you should know who your relationship manager is. If you don't, pop it in the chat. Just let us know where you're from. We can make sure that you're put in touch with the relevant person and we can follow that up immediately after the session today as well. And then you might be sat here and actually think, this is brilliant, but we can't do it. I want it. I want to make sure that people can access it, but we physically, although we have the right people, don't have the skills to deliver the qualification. Come and speak to the relationship management team. That's what we're here for. What we'll do is we'll put you in touch with the most relevant training provider that's already set up to deliver the qualification. And then you'll be able to work with them so that they can deliver the qualification for the group that you have in mind for the qualification. Hopefully that makes sense. The email address that's just on the end there of the relationship management team goes through to all of us. So if you do have any questions or queries, you can drop it to all of us. But equally, and just one final slide, if you aren't sure who the, the most relevant person is, there are five relationship managers and they're all their contact details. So you've got Claire, who oversees Southwestern Wales, Elaine, that looks after West Midlands and Yorkshire and Humber, Mel, that looks after Eastern and East Midlands, Myself, who looks after Northeast, Northwest, and Scotland, and Paul, who's did a fantastic job of leading this, looking after the Southeast and London. So, I hope that all made sense. If anybody's got a burning question they want to ask now, feel free. If not, I will just hand you back to Paul to take you on to the following guest speakers. I'll just pass you back to Paul. Thank you very much, Pete. Really appreciate you sharing so much information there about this qualification. Um, and obviously many of the benefits that it actually provides. Um, clearly there is a big issue with this, hence why um, it's now in the public domain and available to you all. Um, as Pete mentioned, um, now we're gonna be passing on to another one of our guest speakers. Um, this time it's Kaylee Boothby, um, who's the teaching and learning coach at Boston College. Um, Kaylee has already delivered this qualification to some of the learners there. So I'm just gonna pass you over now. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Kaylee, and I work at Boston College and we are a further education college based in rural Lincolnshire. Um, so just to make you aware, 20% of our cohort of learners, English is not their first language. So this was a really good uh, qualification to pilot with them. Also, agriculture is quite central to the economy in Boston and the town has seen its population increase significantly with large numbers of immigrant workers attracted by the availability of low skilled work in fields and factories in and around the town. So this sector, as you've already discussed in your breakout rooms, is one where workers can easily be exploited. 
So as a result, the project, we piloted it with learners to raise awareness of potential issues with the local job market. It helps them with their next steps into the world. And it's about educating people and raising awareness within the local community, which links to the point that Frank made about colleges being embedded in a local community. So moving on to the qualification, we piloted it with different levels of learner groups. So we piloted it with level one business learners, level two plumbing learners, level two hairdressing, and level three health and social care. So we wanted a cross section and a mix of male and female and speakers of different languages. Um, so the groups were selected um, because it's about the sectors that they're progressing into as well, can often be at risk sectors. So the course materials that were designed, they really held the learners attention and interest. The content of the course includes mixtures of videos, example pay slips, case studies on different types of employment options and interactive quizzes. Now the learners really liked these and it kept them moving on to the next part of the course. As previously explained by some of the other presenters today, the course is all online, which is absolutely great. But a flat version of the workbook can also be downloaded or distributed to you. One learner really preferred this. They shared how they took it home. They wanted to share the content with their family to help educate them as well. So I think sometimes in today's age, we make the assumption that learners prefer digital learning but definitely there is still a mixture out there today where learners do prefer um, a bit of both. So we found that using the interactive resources on the platform with learners worked really well. It supported their engagement with the project and it really held their interest. So learners' confidence grew throughout the pilot. Their confidence grew in classroom discussions, their contributions developed, and their understanding about employment rights and responsibilities um, developed over the period of doing the qualification. It was a really challenging year that we ran the pilot in and it was at times difficult, but we hit a few administrative glitches running the pilot, but that's given us the opportunity to work through these with the skills education group. Um, and now obviously the qualification is more widely distributed. This has all been um, tweaked and um, it's now an easier way to access the platform. So speaking more specifically about learners, the health and social care learners, they shared their feedback on how the qualification has helped them to spot the signs of labor exploitation who to contact for help and support. It's helped them to know um, what should be in a contract of employment and who to talk to if they have any questions or concerns, because often young people, they get a job and they're so pleased they have a job. They don't want to say anything or feel that they're speaking out of turn if they ask any questions and they don't want to put themselves at risk. So it was good for them to be made aware that actually it's OK to do that and the right channels and ways to manage that, that um, information. So the learners enjoyed it and they liked that they could see their progress because on the online platform, it tells them the percentage that they are through the qualification. And they love the fact that they can receive instant feedback as they are completing the course. They found it motivating and they found it useful. So learners now feel confident to give advice to their friends and family on job seeking, interview skills, contracts and spotting signs of labour exploitation. I'm certainly obviously uh, love promoting this course and I hope you'll all agree after today when you know a little bit more about it that it's a really interesting qualification for learners to study and it's something different to their main course of study as well. The qualification would sit well in a variety of places within the curriculum. A natural fit would be part of a tutorial programme it would also act as preparation for learners getting ready to go on to work experience or industry placements, or especially if they're on an apprenticeship programme. It's also really good for adults that are re-entering the job market, or it could be weaved into any study being undertaken on employment or work preparation. Overall, the qualification fills a skills gap in the market. So 
that's sort of the feedback from Boston. And again, I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. And um, I'll hand back to Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kaylee. I really appreciate that. Um, you can really tell that you've put a lot into this qualification, how much it means to you. So it's great to, to hear you share that. Thank you very much. Um, we've now got one more guest speaker um, in Jill Simpson. Um, she's the Senior Area Education Manager um, at Workers Education Association and also was part of the initial pilot to create the qualification. Um, can I hand you over to you now, please, Jill? Thanks, Paul. Hi, everybody. Um, so, hi, I'm Jill from the Workers Education Association. We're a community learning provider. Um, we're a national provider, but I'm based in Greater Manchester. So when we piloted the qualification earlier this year, uh, we delivered it to a broad range of learners in Greater Manchester. And they included learners who were at risk of exploitation, but also those who were supporting individuals who were at risk of exploitation, because it was a such a relevant qualification to um, help people understand where the, the pitfalls were. What we learned about this was you don't know what you don't know. So by doing the qualification, it really helped people to understand where the, the gaps in knowledge were. Um, the online platform was really easy to access uh, and the tutor feedback was that it was really easy to mark uh, and be able to give learners feedback. Moving forward, I, I don't want to tell you everything because Kaylee's told you loads of things that I was going to tell you as well, but we, we agree with Kaylee and everything that she said. We think the qualification is, is excellent, but moving forward, um, the WA are hoping to deliver the course to a broad range of learners um, in care, ESOL and also support work. We also find it's an excellent conversation starter. Um, in Greater Manchester, we're expecting 2,000 British National Overseas Passport holders um, into the boroughs in the next sort of three to four weeks. So we've been speaking to the local authorities to ask how we can support them um, and give those learners access to this qualification. And of course that supports us as a learning provider to um, access other pathways and other opportunities. So it is, if you're a training provider, it is a great conversation starter with local authorities, et cetera. Um, and I think, also, as a community learning provider, we have a responsibility at the workforce is changing, the diversity of the workforce is changing, um, where we did have lots of Eastern European learners and workforce individuals, they've now gone, gone home for one reason or another, and we're finding that we're getting lots of people from new countries where the rules are different and everything's changed. So I think as a community learning provider, we're definitely going to go out there and really shout about this qualification and make sure that everybody has access to it because it's really, really important um, to allow all of our learners to have access to it. Uh, whether they're returning to work or whether they're supporting individuals who are at risk of exploitation, we hope to be able to share this qualification with everybody. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Paul, that's it. Thank you very much for your time there, Jill, really appreciate it. Um, we're now gonna go into an interactive poll. Um, so I'm gonna pass you to my colleague, Mel, um, to set that up. Hi again, everyone. So um, I'm not sure if any of you have done the um, polls through um, Zoom before, but essentially what happens is I'll launch the poll and what you'll get is a pop up box and um, you just literally select the answer to each question that um, is appropriate for you. And where, uh, so this first poll, there's only one question, but the second poll, there's a few more. So you might have to scroll down to see some of the other questions. So, um, I'll launch the first poll, which is just a bit of a knowledge question, really. So um, you should all see that appear on your screen now. Um, it, so the question is, how would you rate your knowledge on workers' rights and labour exploitation? Um, and this is following all the information and everything that, that you've had today. And then once um, everyone's answered this, I will go on to the next one. Okay, so I'll end that. Trying to get, all right, I'm unmuted, thank you. Um, and <clears throat> thank you for what you shared, Kaylee and Jill as well. Um, I'm just really interested in how you delivered it personally yourself, the, the qualification. Did you do it 
online with your learners or did you do a work-based or a blended approach? Um, with us, because of the situation that we were in at the time, um, we had some cohorts that were fully delivered online, and then we had one group that it was actually delivered um, in the classroom. So it was done face to face, but they did complete everything electronically um, because we delivered it in um, a computer room so they could go along online at the same time. Right, so that, that's the next question, because I, I've kind of piloted it with two, with two learners uh, a couple right. of weeks ago, and I'm new to tutoring as well, so any, um, any help is greatly appreciated. Um, yes, so when, when you were doing it online with them, did you actually sit with them and go through the questions and the videos while they were online and then left them to answer the questions? Yeah, so we would go through some content, have some discussions, Q&A, um, ask learners to share any experiences, their thoughts and feelings. Then if there was videos to watch, we would play them on the big screen. But if the learners preferred just to plug their headphones in and listen to them themselves, they could. Um, the benefit of sort of doing it that way and having the learners access in the content online was that if they wanted to change the language that they could as well, which was really helpful. Um, and um, that, you know, the learners really, really found that, that that helped them, especially with some of the terminology and the qualification and depending on the level of the learner. But then when it came to answering the questions, we would obviously facilitate, but the majority of it, we would leave to them individually or they can have a chat with each other, do a bit of peer work together, that kind of thing. That is perfect, Kelly. That's just what I needed to hear. Um, okay. Because what I did do is, so this is for everybody else not to do this. So what I did is I put a lot of work on myself and I created five power pints and I did all the resources and I took some of your information. And yes, and then I realized when I got onto the workbook that this was all there. So yeah. working alongside the learner with the workbook is, is the, yeah, is the answer. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. It will make your life so much easier for you. I could have done with you in my pocket a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you for that um for that question june so um as we're coming towards the end of the event now and there's literally a few minutes left um i know that i'm sure there's a few questions that, that other people would like to ask so i'm going to open the floor now so anyone who'd like to raise their hand or or sort of ask a question to anyone else who's been on this event feel free to do so so neil has um he's got shotgun he's put something in the um chat already so neil do you want to um come off mute or uh, apologies, I can't find the little hand that I'm supposed to stick up because I can't work Zoom at all. Um, yeah, I'm working for a client at the moment and we're thinking about um, putting new kickstart applicants through this because from what you said, it would be absolutely ideal for new people coming in, young, young people, to give them, you know, a, a good grounding over what type of thing they can, they can be looking out for because basically it's a recruitment company that they've been placed with. Uh, and I'm just just want to know a little bit more about funding streams for that, those type of individuals. If if there is a funding stream, doesn't matter if there isn't, because obviously with Kickstarters you get government funding anyway, so it's part of that development. Yeah, do you want to answer this? Yes. Okay, I'll come in. Uh, okay. Hi, Neil. That's the head of policy and funding. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Neil, in, uh, correcting what you're saying, in terms of kickstart, yes, the funding is already there given to utilise for training these, these individuals. Obviously, if you were doing it under a study programme, then you have got the uh, AEB and the 16 to 19 funding. But for a kickstart, you automatically get that bulk of money up front to utilise for the training of this, for this qualification. Does that help? Yeah, that's fine. What, what is the cost of the actual uh, training? I'll answer that. Right. The, the, um, we just charge for the registration and certification, and depending on volume, it's £28 at advertised price, but the actual then cost of the training depends on who the training provider is. So different colleges and providers will have their own, own costs to add to that. Um, but what the providers yours is a 28 pound that's advertised on the website for registration certification. Okay. Any other questions? 
Um, Paul, I know you had your hand raised and, and I just took it down. Um, sorry for me to be very rude. Had you finished your question or do you have another? No, no, I, th I think the phrase is legacy hand, isn't it? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we all have a legacy hand. That's brilliant. Um, again, anyone else, feel free. This is very much an open forum now um, to sort of ask any questions and we'll feel the best we can. Yeah, and feel free to ask any of the speakers. Obviously, we've got Frank here for the next two minutes and we've got... Um, uh, Kaylee and Jill as well. So feel free to um, shoot any questions our way as well. Okay. Um, it appears we don't have any more questions, um, but I think that just leaves me to say thank you um, to each and every one of you for coming and, and giving up your time this afternoon to attend this event. Um, hopefully you found it very informative. Um, I, for one, have really enjoyed uh, sort of speaking to each one of you, um, and I know a few of my colleagues have really enjoyed sharing more about this qualification. Um, again, thanks to all of the guest speakers uh, for speaking so openly and honestly about the qualification and letting us know sort of what, you know, you've put into it to, to deliver such a fantastic qualification. Um, so thanks again for all of your time, everyone.